Welcome. We are so glad you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're here in the building, we are glad you're here. If you're joining us Facebook Live, we are glad that you're here. If you're going to watch us on YouTube later, enjoy the day. Do whatever you need to do. But God is going to do some amazing things today. We believe that coming expecting a, a blessing today before you even walk into the doors of the church, we should all be going, you know what, God? I am here I want you to speak to me, but more importantly, give me a blessing, give me something that I can take hold of, I can take bite of, I can live on that throughout the week, and we can fill up our spiritual gas tanks on Jesus, and we know that whatever the world throws our way, we're going to deflect it away and go, you know what, God is in control, it doesn't matter what is tossed my way, He is the one that guides me. We are so glad you're here. I'm going to ask you to stand, we're going to do something a little different, we're going to kind of go back to this scripture reading. And we all want to read this scripture together out loud because this is kind of where we're going to. And we're starting a series today, and the series is entitled Liar, Liar. And it's the lies that we believe about the enemy that kind of gets us off track. It's the lies that sometimes are told to us. But the scripture is true, and it tells us each and every day that we, we don't have to listen to what the enemy says. So here we go. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32 would you read it with me? To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's the scripture we're gonna build on today. I want you to think about that. We're gonna sing some songs in a minute. We're gonna repeat the scripture, but that's the scripture that we're gonna build on. If you want to turn your Bibles, John chapter eight, if you electrical devices, whatever you use, that is the foundation of who we are and what we're doing. So let's read it one more time with a lot of power and a lot of conviction and a lot of belief. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Father God, we are here to worship. We are here to learn. We are here to honor you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for speaking with us. And God, thank you just for being Jesus. We love you, we honor you, we praise you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Remain standing as we sing.
you believe that. I really do. And I hope that you understand that God loves you more than you can ever imagine. And it's an amazing thing. I love that line in there where it says, I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the ways that he loves us. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for being here and speaking to us and encouraging us and loving us. And God, thank you just for being God. And for doing all the amazing things that you do that we don't even think about. God, it's just humbling. It's humbling to know that you love us. And Father, as we go into this service today and we continue in an attitude of worship, we also know that there are a lot of people that are still hurting. And so, Father, we pray for them. We pray, God, that uh, you will touch the body, that you will uh, be with them and give them strength We know the diagnosis may not be in our favor, but God, you're still in control, and we still, we still cling to you. Father, we know that there's so many things that we could pray for today. We could go all the way from the top of our country, all the way down to our local communities, and God, we lift every leader up to you in prayer, and we say, please encourage them and keep them strong. Father, thank you for the people that are here. Thank you for their opportunity to come and Worship, God, for the ones that are watching online, we pray that you will just give each and every one of us a word of encouragement, a word to draw closer to you. More importantly, give us a blessing so that we know, we know that you're still with us. Thank you for what you're doing and what you've done. We ask all this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. For the first time in a very, very, very long time, I get to say these words we are now dismissing all of our children to children's church. So if you want to go and and be a part of that, that's amazing. So thank you. Thank you all the workers and thank you for the people. Thank you all the children. It's going to be a fun time. Well, a couple of of quick announcements before we move on. Church board members, don't forget we have a board meeting on Tuesday. Um, Forgot to say that in the announcements. So we have a board meeting on Tuesday. And... um, Thank you for serving. Thank you for doing what you do. Well, we're starting a series, and it's called Liar, Liar. And, uh, but before we, uh, we start, let me tell you a true story. <clears throat> the fact that I have to say, say this when it's true is kind of misleading anyway. <laughs> it might be, think that all the other stories were not true. Uh, but um, let me kind of share with you and be a little transparent. Now, many of you know, many of you don't, some of you will, some of you won't. Um, I feel like Dr. Seuss right now. But we were in youth ministry for a long time, and we did a lot of things that um, we're, we can look back and we can see God's hand moving in a lot of children, a lot of kids. Um, I, I had the privilege of attending an ordination service for uh, a friend of mine that he was ordained, but not only that, his youth pastor that brought him into the ministry is one that I brought into the ministry. So it was kind of a third generational thing. So it's really kind of fun. You can look back and you can say all of that is really kind of neat. But there's also some things that we did that you're going, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? 
And I, I want to share with you one of those what, with your, what were you thinking moments. And um, so it was teen camp, and a, uh, another youth pastor and myself, I'm not going to name any names uh, because I don't want incriminating. <laughs> um, we decided that a game, that game time, it needed to be ramped up. So during teen camp, what you would do is you'd go, you'd sit in the tabernacle, and then you'd have these game times, and it was kind of fun, and it was just full of energy, full of life, and we were deciding that it would be best if we just kind of ramped it up. So we had this big, long meeting uh, weeks and weeks in advance, and so we, we, we put a new twist on bobbing for apples. New twist on bobbing for apples. So what we did is we bought a brand new toilet. The fact that I said that and people chuckled. <laughs> so we bought a brand new toilet. We cleaned it like nobody's business. And we took the wax ring and we created a little ball and we stuck it up underneath so it would hold. <clears throat> and we filled it full of Mountain Dew. See where I'm going with this? Not only that, we had to bob for baby Ruth. You see where I'm going? I, again, this is not a very proud moment, but I'm telling you this because there's a point. So we made this game. And um, <laughs> a couple of teenagers walked in as we were putting this together. And they just said, what are you doing? And I said, we're going to have a new game, and it's called Bobbing. And we just left it at that. And they said, well, what's in it? And without even thinking, I just went, well, come take a look. And they come and take a look. And they're like, what is that? And I, and I just reached in, grabbed out a candy bar, right? And I just went, it's fun. To which the girl just went, Wah! and she ran to the bathroom and she goes, Pastor Lon, he's eating poop. Now, that's a crazy story, but here's the truth of it, and I'm going, no, 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 no. So I go out, and I'm chasing her, and I'm going, I'm not eating poop, and I got this candy bar right here, and it's just going everywhere, and it's just nasty, and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And I, and I say this because here's, here's what I'm, I'm going I'm to tell you. She believed that it was true even though it was a lie. A lie believed as a truth will affect you as if it were true. A lie believed as a truth will affect you even if it's a lie. Now, here's the way, the way that you look at this and the way that you see this, and we kind of broke it down and, and we kind of calmed her down and everything kind of became all right. And by the way, um, I got several phone calls and we never did that again. So I'm just throwing that out there. I was not doing this, but she believed that it was. Now, in this series, we're going to study several different lies that our spiritual enemy wants to use to rob us of our true identity in Christ. You can look at that and go, well, that's kind of a funny thing. And it, you could see how it kind of got taken out of proportion. But I want to look at the scripture because I'm going to tell you right now, one of the enemy's biggest weapons is a lie. You can believe it is true, and if it's a lie, it leads to destruction. Scripture. Here we go. John chapter 8, verse 44. In the words of Jesus, Jesus says, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of all lies. Today we're going to look at some of the most common lies that our spiritual enemy wants us to believe, and that the lie is we have to be strong and we have to hold it all together. I have to be strong and I have to hold it all together. And before we go any further, let me address something. And, and I too believe that we need to, to work hard and we need to try to keep our act together. And I'm not saying... We need to be passive, nor do I say we need to be poor me, I'm so-and-so, and we don't need to go down the pity party path. I'm not talking about that. 
I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when life slaps you right in the face and you're going, I don't know what I can do. Jesus, though, gives us this answer, and we read it in the scripture, and we go back to verse 32. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So today I want to talk about uh, strong beliefs, those categories under the, the lies that we often believe about having to be strong. There's some categories in which we believe that in this area I have to be strong. And I'm going to kind of point out the, what the world tells us versus what the scripture is telling us. And so there's the first one is here. I have to be emotionally strong. What, I, what I'd like for you to do is this. If, you're, if you've even wrongly believed one of these lies and you, you have to be honest enough to say, yeah, I struggle with this. I want you to just kind of think about that for a minute and just, you don't have to raise your hand or anything like that, but I just want you to kind of take this mental, mental category, if you will, and, and put them in boxes and go, yeah, emotionally strong. I have to be emotionally strong. What we'll do is it'll prepare you to hear from God because I'm telling you if you check no in every box, then you're perfect and I'm telling you, you're lying to yourself. There's no such thing as a perfect person. There was one perfect person, his name is Jesus, and he's no longer on the earth. His spirit is here with us. But we don't have perfect bodies. We don't have perfect thoughts. We have all these imperfections that are running through us. And so we, we kind of look at this and we go emotionally strong, especially during the COVID era. I believe there's a COVID depression that's going around so, because there's so many things that we can't do that we used to do that we were able to do in so many areas and now we're just kind of thrown into this chaos. Parents often feel this way about, about their children. They feel this way and they go, eh, I hope my child doesn't have to go through what I went through. And if they do, and maybe there's something happening, then what we say is I have to be emotionally strong for my children. Or maybe it's a, a spouse and they're going through something at work and you're like, I have to be emotionally strong for that person. Or it's a friend that, that lost a loved one or, or we got bad news or, or whatever the case may be, the scenarios are endless and we think to ourselves, I have to be emotionally strong. Sometimes maybe deep down emotionally we're afraid and we feel a little vulnerable. Man, our marriage is messed up but for the sake of the children, we're gonna keep it together. Man, my life is messed up, but you know what? I'm going to go to church, and, and I don't want anybody to know. And so we put on these masks, and I have to be emotionally strong. Man, I don't want anyone to know. Why? Because I have to let people know that I'm emotionally strong. I have to know that. How many of you can say I can relate to that? Here's another one. Provisionally strong. Many of you can relate to this. You know, someone's got to run the household. We've got to keep everything in order. If I don't do it, it's not going to get done. Got to keep food on the table. Got to keep these babies, little bottoms cleaned. Got to feed everybody, make sure all the laundry's done. I got to balance the checkbook. I got to do the yard work. I feel pressure to get it all done. Blah, blah, blah. And we feel these pressures to provide. And we've got to make sure that it's done. We've got to make sure it's done. We're, we're, we're looking forward. And right now, your kids are little. And, and they're growing up. And you're thinking, what happens when they become teenagers? How about braces, automobiles, college? How about all these things that we have to provide for down the road? I have to provide down the road. And I don't know how I'm going to provide for all of this. We've, we have this provisionally strong. And it, sometimes it knocks us to our knees. How many of you would feel like that? Here's another one. I have to be spiritually strong. Maybe you're one of the few Christ followers in your family and you feel like, I have to carry the weight spiritually. I have to carry the weight spiritually. Maybe you've got a lot of people that, that you love and you're not, you're not sure about their spiritual well-being. I have to be the one that's spiritually strong. Can I just say this real fast? You can look up any statistics you want, but I, I would challenge you to look this up. Just look up. When a man of the household becomes a Christian and becomes a spiritual provider, 80% or more of that entire family comes to Christ. When the man of the household's out of the picture, it's around 20%. Let that sink in for a minute. I have to be spiritually strong. 
because this isn't really about me. I have this right here. It says, I am, I N A M. It's not about me. It's about others. It's about helping. It's about the family. It's about friends. I have to be spiritually strong. I have to be spiritually strong. You, you see, you may have a friend and you're, you're afraid to share your faith. And here's the number one reason why people are afraid to share their faith. What if they ask me a question that I don't know the answer to? But I've, I've got to keep up this illusion of being spiritually strong. But what if I don't have the answer to the question? I, do what I do. My best deep theological understanding of your question is I haven't got a clue. But I'm willing to look it up. And I'm willing to dig into the scripture with you because I would like to know the answer to that question as well. It, you don't have to be gifted theologically speaking. You just have to go, you know what, here's what I know. <laughs> I once was, but now I am, and I don't know how that worked. And Jesus has done some amazing things in my life, and I, I can only give it to him. And I'm not the smartest person on the Bible. I may not know the scripture very well. I may not even understand God very well, but I do know this. He's done some amazing things in my life, and I want to live for him. You see, we, we kind of put it into so much. But how many of you can relate? I have to be spiritually strong because in my house, maybe you live alone and you're going, I have to be spiritually strong because in my house, maybe you have friends. I have to be, you see, it's just so crazy. Here's another one. Professionally strong. Some of you got jobs that you hate and you work with psycho people. You work with a lot of crazy people, right? You're laughing. I work with psycho people too. That's you, by the way, if you didn't figure that out. <laughs> I'm joking. Am I really? No. But you're thinking, I've got to endure this thing. I'm working with some crazy people. I just don't get along with that person. I, I, I have to be strong. I have to endure this job that I, I, maybe I don't even like it. I absolutely hate it. I can't stand it. But there's no other job that I can get that has these benefits or this. And, and, and others of you would say, oh, no, my pressure is different. I feel like there's a big weight on my shoulders. And if I don't get it done around here, it's not going to happen. If I underproduce, it could affect a lot of people. There's a lot of, of things riding on my performance in my job. And to be honest, wrongly, I, I, I'm going to tell you this. I feel this a lot. This is the area where I feel this the most. I feel this the most. And, and what if I mess up and hurt the ministry? What if I really make a bad joke and people don't come back? <laughs> and I know what you're saying. We came back and you've told a lot of bad jokes. What if I do something that would embarrass the church? What if I do something that would, do you see, the, the pressure? I feel uh, that kind of pressure. How many of us should say I can relate professionally that I have to be strong? The bad news is this. If you've checked off anything in one of those three areas, there's no hope for you. <laughs> Just go home. Game over. There's no hope. And some of you are going, what? what? You see, that's the lie the enemy wants you to believe. You see how easy that is to just go, there's no hope for you. There's no hope. You're a bad person. And I, and you, you told me you're a total screw-up in all four of these categories. So there's no hope for you. But I don't believe that, do you? I don't believe that for a minute. I don't believe that for a minute. The good news is that Satan says you have to be strong in these four areas. Jesus, though, wants to reveal the truth. And when you experience the truth, the truth said in Scripture is going to set you free. I don't know why it is that a guy, I, I, you know what I mean? We feel that we can't be emotionally vulnerable a lot of times. We feel like physical strength is something that we have to really show. We have to be strong. We're the, we're the alpha males. We're the ones that have to make, we're, we're the providers. We're the hunter-gatherers. We're the, the people that we do all this stuff. We have to be emotionally strong. We have to be physically strong. I have to make sure that we did this. We lived in California and we were, members of the gym, and I played for a softball team that was members there, and we had these workouts that we had to do, and one day Don and I went there, and I was going to show off how far I had come in my workouts, because that's what she wanted to see, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I grabbed these, these dumbbells that were like way too heavy, you know what I'm talking about? 
and I was getting ready to do this bench press. You, you know what I'm talking about. You guys can picture it, right? I'm on the belt, and I'm like, Hoo! and I'm pulling these things up, and you're like, clink, because you want everybody to see you. You know, you're like, clink, like this. You're like, what? And then when Donna turns around, I'm like, 12, 13, you know what I mean? And then it just became, I'm going, oh, this isn't good. Because I had too much weight over my head, and I'm holding these things, and all of a sudden I got the wiggly arm. You know, you know what I'm talking about? And then all of a sudden it just went, boom. And Donna goes, what are you doing? I'm like, it's a new workout. You, you're supposed to do that. You're supposed to boom on the ground so you don't hurt anything. And which was not a lie because I was about to kill myself. But the truth is, the bottom line is no matter how strong you are, no matter how strong you are, I need you to write this down. Your strength is limited. Eventually you run out. No matter how strong you are, your strength is limited, and eventually you'll run out. How many of you are honest right now, and you'd say, yeah, that's where I'm at. Uh, there, there's, there's some things going on more than I can handle. I've got too much going on. I don't know why I'm going to get all done. I don't know how I'm going to do it. How many of you, your fuse is really, really short? It's really short. You explode in anger often at people that you love the most. You feel the pressure of guilt. Well, if I only worked harder, I was better. If I could be a better parent, if I could be a better spouse, if I could be a better provider, I know if I could be a better Christian, but there's just so much going on. I don't have the ability to get it all done. I don't have the ability to go there. I don't have all of this. If you just said that and you thought that, bingo, boom, right then and there, you put your finger on it. Because you're not created by God to have the ability to do it on your own strength. You can't. Your strength is intentionally limited. Okay? But God's strength is unlimited. Your strength that you have is limited. If God created us and he created us with this ability and he created us with this unlimited strength, we wouldn't need him. And that's why God wants us not to depend on our own limited abilities, but to do life empowered by his unlimited spiritual power. We were at a barbecue competition, and for those of you who don't know, um, we sometimes competed in barbecue, and it, it was fun. And it was a Thursday, and we got there. It, it's Friday, Saturday is the, the thing, but we lived really close to this one competition, and we would get there and set up our stuff and it was raining. I mean raining like nobody's business. And it was raining and it was coming down, coming down, coming down. And we had a motor home in our, our trailer and, and I pulled up and the guy looked at me and he said, either your motor home or your trailer but both of them can't go in there, it's, you're not gonna make it. <laughs> so I jumped back in I, and I just looked over and I said, what about this little hill? There was a little valley like this. I said, what about that hill right there? I see there's water and electricity. He goes, if you think you can make it, go ahead. And I was like, okay. So I jump in the motorhome. Donna looks at me and she goes, what'd they say? And I said, buckle your seatbelt. She goes, where's our spot? I said, right there on the hill. Donna goes, we ain't going to make it. I'm like, yep. Yeah, we're going to make it. So we buckled it up. And all of a sudden on the side, I watched a couple of these barbecue people, friends of mine that I know. And they're over here looking and they're going, and I watched one of them, and he did this. He just kind of went. And then he turned around, and he said something. And so here I am. I just threw it in gear, and I gassed it. Boom. And we went through, and we went right up to the side of the hill. Boom, we're there. Put it in park, chalk the blocks. This is where we are. A friend of mine comes over, and he goes, you just made me 20 bucks. And I said, how did that happen? He said, I bet those guys back there 20 bucks that you would make it through the water. And finally, whenever they paid up, they said, how did you know he's going to make it from the water? He's a pastor. He prayed. Those waters parted, and he just went right through it. <laughs> but it was raining. It was muddy, and it was nasty. We're putting saw, uh, a straw down. We got plywood. We're putting it down, and it just kept coming down in buckets, and it coming down in buckets. The competition was over, the sun came out and it started drying up, and next thing you know, it's kind of like the suction cup. You know how Georgia clay is, it's like, 
and we're trying to get people out and people are stuck. And we're digging and we're digging and we're digging and we're digging. And finally, a friend of mine calls me up and says, what are you doing? And I said, we're digging out of this barbecue competition. He says, I have a tractor. It'll be there an hour. Comes over with a tractor. It wasn't just a tractor. It was a tractor that has dual wheels in the front and back. He just comes in, he hooks it up, and he just, burp, 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 all of them. All of them started doing this. Here's what I learned. There's two kinds of strength. There's shovel strength and there's tractor strength. Many of us are doing life on shovel strength. We're trying to dig our way out. I got this. I got this. I got this. I got this. I'd still be digging. I got this. And we're creating a bigger mess. It just gets messier and messier and messier. And finally, God, and God comes. And he sets you in a different place. There's limited human strength and there's unlimited strengths from God. And there's a scripture that my friend and brother and mentor loves, and I'm going to use it right now. Isaiah chapter 40. Even youths. I'm going to stop right there. Because we can blow right through this scripture, and we can go, yeah, that's a good scripture, and everybody knows it, and everybody loves it, but it's a good scripture. But I need to stop right there. Because the word that is translated as youth in the Hebrew is literally talking about athletes. Like Greek Olympic athletes. So when he says youth, what he's saying, the best of the best, the strongest of the strong, the most supreme athletes, the best athletes in the world get tired. They grow tired and weary. And even young men stumble and fall. The best of the best has limited strength. But those who hope, what are they doing? They're hoping in the Lord. Will renew their strength. Not only will they renew their strength, they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let that sink in. They will soar like eagles. But most of the people I know don't soar like eagles. We fly around like hummingbirds. We fly around with our wings, are like and we dive bomb, and we do these crazy things, and we waste so much energy when the people that are putting their hope in God, they're just going around like, look at that little hummingbird right there. I'm not wasting energy. I'm doing what I was created to do. I'm not worrying on that. I'm giving that to God. Why? Because I run and grow tired. But my hope is in Jesus Christ. You see, it's different. It's different. Here's the lie. You gotta be strong, you gotta try harder, you gotta be better. If you just cared more, if you were more faithful, if you just worked harder at it, then you could get it done. The Father all lies. I have to be strong. But here's the truth. You have to be weak broken, vulnerable, and dependent. You have to be weak, broken, vulnerable, and dependent. How do I know this? <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, he learned this. And we see God, kind of God's lesson in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Context of the story is this, and, and we'll look up that scripture in a minute. Paul, Paul had something that was driving him crazy. He called it a thorn in his side. Not a lot of people know what it is. They, it, we just know that it bugged the stew out of him, and he begged God to take it away. Please take this from me. I, I can't just take this from me. God, take it. 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 And in his desperation, God spoke to Paul. And here's what said. God says, my grace is sufficient for you. We don't want that. I don't want that. For my power 
is made perfect in what? You can say it out loud. Weakness. My power, God's power, is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. You see, that's, that's a different scripture, isn't it? It's a different way of reading it. My power. Wow. And then verse 10. Here's what Paul says. That's why for Christ's sake, that's why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. I don't have to have it all together. You see, the world tells you you have to have it all together. That's not what the scripture says. That is counter to what scripture says. Well, I've got my act together. No, you don't. We just don't know what you're struggling with. And that's okay. But here's what the scripture, because the scripture doesn't say, to those of you who are not perfect, to those of you who have everything together, it doesn't say to all of those who are, are, are okay and you don't think that you need this, or, or it doesn't say anything this. It literally says, that's why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, persecution, difficulties. And then he goes on to say this, for when I am weak, then I am strong. The word delight comes from a Greek word. It means, if you're taking notes, to think of well. It means to delight, to embrace. Think of well of your weakness. Embrace your weakness. So I have a question. What weaknesses do you need to embrace? This is my weakness. I know what my weaknesses are. I want you to think about that. And my style is to be very open with our church family. I'm very transparent in a lot of areas. And it becomes increasingly more difficult when I'm really, really honest. A lot of people freak out because they like to have a pastor that has it all together. But I continue to risk it and I have to embrace the weaknesses that I can't get it all done. That's my weakness. I am weak. I struggle with schedule. I'm consumed with guilt. I want to do more for the church. I, I don't want to be this. I want to do this. I'm not as good as a pastor as others. I, I know there's better pastors out there. And I'm consumed with that I don't measure up. Side note. People knowing or not knowing, if you're a pastor, this is thrown in your face almost every day the comparison trap. Knowing or not knowing, it's thrown in your face every day. Well, I like what so-and-so has to say. I like their church. I like this. I like that pastor. I like this pastor. And I don't say it for recognition. I'm saying this is a weakness, and this is how the enemy tries to get you. I recognize it. I'm working on it. But when I buy into that lie, I'm at risk all the time. I have to do better. I have to be strong. If I was really good, if I really cared, if I was a better pastor, I'd be this and I'd do this, the other thing. The truth is I have to embrace the weaknesses that I, I will never get all done, nor am I called to get it all done. Do you see the lie? You got to get it all done. There's always something more. There's always something more. Think about your job. There's always something more. There's always something more. There's always something more. It's not really task. It's about being personable. I'm not good enough. And, that, and in those times that I say I'm absolutely weak, that then God honestly gets more done through me than when I'm in the blah, 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 blahs. It's tough. I have to be weak. I have to be weak today. I hurt today because I'm not good enough. Maybe God will do more through my weakness. That's me being transparent. That's me being honest. That's me being me. Because I believe sometimes people put pastors on pedestals 
And I'll say this, pastors are no different than anybody else. We just live in a glass house. Well, I want a pastor that's strong. I'm telling you this because I am strong. Because I know that I know that I know God called me to this, and if he called me to it, he'll see me through it. Therefore, I don't rely on the applause of men. I focus on what God has called me to do. Here I am before you. You don't have to have the strength of your schedule for you to schedule. Some of you are trying to hold your marriage together. You can't do it. God's got to do it for you. You're trying to get your kids back to going to do the right thing. You can't change people. Only God can. You're in the financial hole. I got to get out of this hole. Only God can do it. You're not created to do it on your own. I have to be weak. So do you. We have to be weak together. That's why we do life together and not just come to church and worship. We have to do life together. We have to get involved in each other. Because scripture tells me as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Therefore, I carry with you. I carry with you. You carry with me. We pray for each other. We encourage each other. You are not created to do it on your own. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And I want to hope that you'll see this verse like you've never seen it before. I'm going to break it down and I'm going to show you something that maybe you've never saw it before. And maybe you don't, you don't have the resources that, that I do. You don't have a thesaurus like I do and you don't read this kind of stuff. But I'm going to put it into a perspective for you. And I hope you'll see it. I want you to look at it in the original Greek version. Okay? There's some words that I want you to look at. Number one, charis is grace. Charis is grace. And very literally means unmerited favor. It means divine influence upon the heart. It's from God, not from us. Archio, sufficient. Sufficient. It means unlim- uh, eliminating a barrier. It means sufficient or exactly enough. It is exactly enough. Okay? Dunamis which is dynamite, where we get the word dynamite from. It means explosive, miraculous power. Explosive, miraculous power. Here's the other word. Telelestai. It is finished. Literally means fulfilled. The same words that Jesus said on the cross. It is finished. It's the word he used. It's the word he used. And the last word. Asthenio, weakness. It means disease, infirmity, or, or brokenness. You have those words. So let's put it into a sentence. My charis is archio for you, for my denimus is made telestai in asthenio. And you're going, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. So let me put it in the NLV the new Lonnie version. God's divine influence exactly enough to meet your every need. For his explosive, miraculous power is made completely perfect in you when you are broken before him. Do do you understand that verse now? A little bit better? It's a different way of looking at it. Your spiritual enemy would love for you to believe that you can be stronger, that you can work it out, that you can pull it off, and you can't. You can't. I have to be weak. You have to be weak. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. For it's only by might, it's not by our power, it's not by our efforts, but by his spirit. And those... You have too much. You can't handle it. I just can't handle it. It's good news. That's good news. How do I know that? You're not created to handle it alone. I don't think God is this God that looks down and goes, well, you're on your own. Just do life. You don't listen to me anyway. You do your own thing anyway. That's not it. 
We sang a song just a few minutes ago, Oh, How He Loves You. And I really believe that some people, if they really understood the power, the power you have on this earth, the power that you have to get through, the power that you have to sustain you, oh, how he loves you. If you understand how much love he has for you, the agape love, unconditional love, the love that is unmeriting, we don't deserve it, but he gives it to us, this love that gives grace and mercy. I've messed up a thousand times just in one day, and God still loves me. How do you love me? I am unlovable. That's the enemy talking. Everybody is lovable. Everybody is lovable in God's eyes. We need to see it that way. You see, you don't have to have it all together. Let me ask you this question. How desperate are you for God? See, that's the question. That's the question. How desperate are you for God to take whatever it is you're dealing with, and give you direction. How desperate. I got this. I'm not going to mess with, this is such a little thing, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna deal with that. That's the enemy. I'm not gonna rely on God for, that's the enemy. You see, it's the little things that we, we, we don't do. We're like, eh, I don't need to do that. God, I've got this one. And then the more we build it up, it's like courage. The more I, the more I do it, the more I, I do it, the more. Some of you, you would be hard-pressed to believe this. <laughs> when I was in high school, I had stage fright. I couldn't speak in public. I, would, I skipped school if I had to read a paper that I wrote with one sentence on it. And I knew that I had to read it in that class. I would just skip school. Were you going to get three licks? Give me three licks. I'd rather take the licks than read because I just can't be on a stage. I can't be there. I can't do this. God, I can't. When God called me into the ministry, I just went, huh. Now you know why I ran for so long. I just went, God, no, 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 no. We need to talk about this. We need to talk about this. And here's what God says. On your own, you're... Mm -mm. But with me, it was told to me years and years and years ago, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. If God calls you, he will sustain you. Moses, I stutter. <laughs> God, I'm a stutterer. Go all through the scripture and you'll find people that had weaknesses and they went, you know what, God, I'm all in. I'm all in. So the question comes back to this. What are you dealing with? What are you dealing with? I'm gonna ask you to stand if you would. Because some of you are desperate and some of you are like, you know what, I'm tired. I am tired. I've been dealing with this for, and I'm just tired. I'm wore out. You see, I, I'm dealing with the comparison trap. I'm tired and I'm wore out. God, I can't do this. When I first got up to speak, I tried to be John Maxwell because I love his leadership. And I sat down one day in my office and I went, God, I don't know what I'm doing. And he goes, I know what you're doing. You're trying to be somebody you're not. I didn't call you to be a John Maxwell. I called you to be a Lonnie Grant because I've already got a John Maxwell, but I need a Lonnie Grant. You may not reach thousands, but you're going to reach some. And you know what? Those some, they're going to be going into heaven. And because of what you are doing and because of this. So think about, I don't have time to maintain these regrets. When I think about the way he loves me, I don't have time to maintain all my struggles and all my guilt. When I think about the way God loves me, I don't have time to compare to other people. When I think about the way he loves me, oh, how he loves me. That's where I'm at. I don't have time. Enemy, get behind me. 
because you're the father of all lies and I'm not listening. I wish I could stand here today and tell you that I'm 100% not listening, but there's these little things that creep in and I go, I got this, and I realize I'm relying on my own strength and when I put that God strength compared to my shovel strength, things change. Just bow your head and close your eyes. For those of you who are watching, I would love for you to just kind of bow your head and close your eyes. If you want to stand, that's fine. But we're going to say a little prayer. And I just want you to know that I'm going to pray for you. And if you want to say a prayer, for those of you who are in the building, if you want to come and kneel at an altar, these altars are right here if you want to do that. If not, that's fine. If you want to stay right where you're at and you want to pray, that's fine. But we're going to say a prayer. Father God, here we are. We come to you because we do stand here, sit, kneel, broken. And we are calling out to you. And Father, I know there's some people that are dealing with some issues right now that are so big and so deep that I wouldn't even know how to answer those questions. But God, as they cry out to you, would you hear each heart individually? And Father, for those that are maybe going, I don't have any problems, would you just tap them on the shoulder and point it out and go, what about this? What about this? God, we have to cry out to you because we were created not to do this alone, but we were created to rely heavily on you. And God, here we are. We are relying on you. And Father, the good news is that we have a Father that is bigger than what's the matter. We have a God that is greater than any divide. We have a God that is bigger than what is going on in the world today. And Father, when we rely on you, our encouragement grows, our strength grows, our, our life grows, our heart grows bigger. We see others, we reach out, we share, we grow. And God, we draw deeper into you and we just ask right now, would you please deal with whatever we are dealing with in our lives. Father, we bring these things to you. We lay them at an altar of prayer, whether standing, sitting, kneeling, wherever that is. We come and we just say, here they are. This is my obstacle. This is my false sense of strength. This I bring to you. God, what an amazing day. What an amazing journey we're going to be on in this series called Liar, Liar. Father, would you press it upon people's hearts to join in with us each and every week so that we can draw closer to you through our knowledge of the scripture and the knowledge of who you are. God, thank you. Thank you just for being God. Thank you for this day. And thank you for an opportunity to come and worship. God, be with us and encourage us. And we say thank you again for being God. We ask this in your name. Amen. I've been blessed. How about you? Amen? Well, here's what we do. We do have uh, a series the rest of the, week, of the month. We would love for you to join us. But right now, as the praise team is going to sing a song, here's what we would love to do. We would love to offer you an opportunity to give. Uh, some people have said, you know, at the end of the service, we always give. And so I'm just going to make this announcement. If you want to give... There are three ways that you can give if you want to do it digitally, if you want to give in the back right there while they're singing, or if you want to bring it in and drop it off this week, however you want to do that. We are just blessed that you are able to give. But we also want to close with a song of encouragement, and I think you're going to like this song. So here's what we want to do is make sure that we are singing praises to the King of Kings. And the rule we have around here, we don't care if you sing on key or off key, sharp or flat. I don't care if your friend or your neighbor, they can even sing. We're not singing to one another. We're singing the praises to God. So as the praise team sings, just sing your praises to God. If you feel like raising a hand going, you know what? I'm going to praise God and I'm going to give the enemy a black eye. That would be powerful. Just let your heart pour out and let's sing praises to the king.
hold every lightning bolt where it should go. I hope that's your song today, and you are an amazing God. Go in peace. Thank you, and know this. We love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Have an amazing day. Guys, you're blessed.